you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Are dreams still relevant? What does it mean to dream about the man of God giving you guidance and direction in a certain manner or in a certain matter? Does this mean you must contact the man of God or must you wait for him to locate you? None of the above. If he already gave you the guidance in the dream, then that's the guidance. Then you follow it if it's according to the scriptures. Remember, when a man of God gives you guidance, it always um, it always agrees with the Word of God. If it doesn't agree with the Word of God, throw it away. doesn't matter that you got it in a dream or in a vision. If it's not consistent with God's Word, let it go. Any guidance 
from a man of God must be consistent with God's eternal word. And if you saw a man of God in your dream, it doesn't mean go look for him. And doesn't even mean wait until he finds you. Except, of course, if the dream said to go there. Because, for example, uh, you remember when an angel uh, appeared to Cornelius the Roman centurion and said to him to send for Peter. And he did. Now, if the instruction in the dream was to do likewise, that's not a problem. Then you do it. But, question. It's important if you're a Christian, tell your minister what revelation you got. Tell your pastor. If it's not, that is especially if you got a dream about someone else other than your pastor. Go and meet your pastor and say, this was the dream I had. And this, this voice, whatever it was, told me to go and see that minister. Hear what your pastor is going to tell you. It's important. He'll guide you. He'll guide you properly. Okay. Pastor. Now, <laughs> Sorry, yes, Pastor. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, um, I think that in the New Testament, you are primarily led by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Because you have cases. Somebody once came to church and said that they saw, had a dream or saw something. I didn't even let the person finish. Just started saying something like, uh, I saw darkness. I said, there's no darkness here. <laughs> you can't see darkness, you know? So, um, yeah, sometimes there are, dreams can be misleading, of course. But that's why I said talk to your pastor, because through the knowledge of God's word, you can be guided. Because Satan uses dreams a lot. And that's why you don't find much of uh, the use of dreams from those who receive the Holy Spirit. See, they seldom have guidance through dreams. Very, very rarely. You'd see dreams in the Old Testament. You'd see dreams. And when God talks to you in a dream, it's usually more than a dream. See, you, you would know it. No one will have to interpret it for you that God spoke to you. In the New Testament, it's so important that we understand the differences. And I've dealt on the subject of dreams and different kinds of dreams. So get to our website, pastorchrisonline.org, and find out about those questions that we have asked already in the archives. And you'll find... Um, some particular ones that are about dreams. And I did deal with that in an elaborate manner. So check with the website. It is Pastor Chris said in one of his messages that I was listening to here on the internet that there is no sin in drinking alcohol. But it is written in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, that the drunkard will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't you understand that there's a difference between eating and gluttony? Isn't there a difference between to drink and to be a drunkard? They're not the same. Now, the Bible shows us to be a glutton is wrong. But it doesn't mean that if you eat, Something's gone wrong with you. Okay, let me read to you from the Bible. Proverbs chapter 23. Go to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 23. From verse 20. Listen to what it says. Be not among wine bibers, that's drunkards. Among riders, eaters of flesh. He says, for the drunkard and the gluten shall come to poverty. The drunkard and the gluten shall come to poverty. Now, who's a gluten? Someone who preoccupies himself with eating, who continually eats and eats too much and keeps on craving more and more food. Now, we are not going to ask people or anybody, hey, is it good to eat? Or are you going to ask, is it wrong to eat? Since it is wrong to be a gluten? You're not going to ask that stupid question. You know it's okay to eat. But preoccupying yourself with eating and eating uncontrollably, he says it's wrong. You're going to come to poverty. That's the same thing with being a drunkard. That's what he was saying in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 10 where he mentioned drunkards. So to drink 
and to be a drunkard are not the same. It's the same like saying that you ate or that you were a gluten. They're not the same. So um, straighten yourself. Straighten yourself. Ask wise questions. Don't ask foolish questions. from the United Kingdom. Dear sir, I married an unbeliever and have four kids with him. Then I encountered Christ and he said to me that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I rededicated my life to Christ. My husband refused to stay with me as his wife. And we divorced because of my faith in Christ. I am rooted and grounded in Christ, a partaker of the nature of Christ, and I am raising my kids as a single parent. When I explained my situation to one of my pastors in church, asking him to pray for me, I was asked to step down from my leadership position and to return my kids to their unbelieving father. The kids' custody was given to me in court. Sir, is it wrong to open up before those in authority over me and ask for counseling? I want to know if I'm at fault because I kept my faith and got addicted to Christ. Please help. Thank you. Tabitha. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'll just take a part of it. You want to take a part of it? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Um, Pastor, from um, the Bible in First Corinthians chapter 7. And I'll read verse 14, sir. Yeah. It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Now about the children, say, Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. And looking at it from the scripture, I think um, because she's addicted to Christ, assuming the children haven't come to the age of accountability, I'm looking at it from this aspect that um, I've been saved, you know, has a covering for these children, you know, and then um, he says, but now are they holy? And since she had the custody from the court for the children, I don't think there's any reason sending these children to the father who is an unbeliever to raise them up. So from this, I, I think that um, she can still keep the, have the custody of those kids and still be in church. I think the issue now here is that she, yeah. she, uh, she was asked to step down mm. from a leadership. Uh, yes, she was asked to step down. But to down. return the children to her uh, husband. Yeah, that's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a complex situation. Complex, yes. complex because um, you're, you're thinking that it's because you you told one of you, your pastors about your situation that you were asked to step down from your leadership position. What if that were not the case? Because you spoke to one of the pastors. You didn't say, I spoke to my pastor. It's one of the pastors you spoke to. And I don't think it's that one of the pastors that has the authority to change your position. Now, if he did, if he had the authority, then of course you can take the matter forward to the senior pastor and find out what the real issue is because it may not be this particular uh, reason that you're thinking. Secondly, um, I find it curious that you were told to return the children to their father in spite of the court uh, uh, custody that you, that you got. Um, I'm thinking you are not telling me everything. And it's difficult for you to tell me everything just by asking this question. Interestingly, your question is not even all the things you said. I want to tell you what your question is. Your question here is, is it wrong to open up before those in authority over me and ask for counseling? I want to know if I'm at fault because I kept my faith, you see. No, you're not at fault for keeping your faith. Secondly, is it wrong to open up before those in authority? 
No, it is not. Depends on who in authority you're saying. It didn't say open, to, open up to everybody in authority. Go to your pastor. That's important. And then if the pastor has set someone over you, then if you're not satisfied with the judgment or uh, counseling from that particular person, seek audience with the pastor through that leader that's appointed over you. Say, so, I'd like to see the pastor. I don't agree with what you have said. I would like to see the pastor. That's, he will not take offense. He'll say it's all right because the pastor authorized him to be there. And he should find it easy to say, okay, I'll take you to the pastor. I'll make an appointment for you. It's simple. We're brethren. If, if you don't agree with the way you were counseled on something, seek to take it forward to the senior pastor. That's the right way. Even if they tell you it was the pastor that said so. If you're not in agreement with it, say, I would like to speak with him myself because maybe, maybe I was not properly represented to him. And it's possible. So that's what you're going to do. So at this, at this stage, I don't think that you're supposed to, um, to do this. That is to send the children back to... Um, to the unbelieving father, you've got to hear from the pastor. You really have got to hear from the pastor. You need to because he can enlighten you further on whatever they're thinking in this situation. All right. At first, I didn't know who God was. As I first entered the doors of Christ's embassy in 2009 and listened to pastor's teaching, I fell in love with, me, with my creator. Now I am a fully devoted Christian. Praise God for you. Then he says, Pastor, I have a question for you. Is it allowed to have dreadlocks when you are a Christian? All right, now, um, dreadlocks. Let's talk about the hair, you know, this... Uh, firstly, there's nothing wrong with your hairstyle, whether it is dreadlocks, deadlocks, live locks, whatever locks they are. Nothing is wrong with your locks. The Bible tells us about some men that had long hair and, you know, all kinds of things in the Bible. But, and how long is long? Okay. Now, what's important is this. You always want to be decent, okay? You always want to communicate with those in your world, all right? And um, if, for example, you had dreadlocks before you were born again, can you imagine with your dreadlocks, Jesus saved you? How were you born again with dreadlocks? Meaning that he wasn't put off with your dreadlocks. See that? So that means that's not the problem. That's not the problem. If you would rather have a different hairstyle, go ahead and have a different hairstyle. But I have a little something to tell you about these dreadlocks. Just for good information for you. Um, the dreadlocks became popular through those who are called Rastafarians, okay? And if your dreadlocks are based on the Rastafarian society, there is a problem, and I want to explain what that problem is. When you say, I know a lot of people who do these things don't even have an idea where it came from. When you say uh, uh, Rasta, which is an abbreviation for those who are Rastafarians, Rastafarian came from two names, Ras and Tafari. Now, those are actually the names of a man who lived many years ago, Ras Tafari Makonen. That's the man who became Emperor 
Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, who lived, um, uh, he was 83 years old when he died. He, he died in 1975. Now, the Rastafarians are known as worshippers of Rastafari, the man who became Emperor Haile Selassie. He was Rastafari Makanen. So this was, this was their symbol, the Rastafari symbol. So if you say that you are a Rasta or a Rastafarian, that's actually what you're saying. You are saying that you are a worshiper of Haile Selassie because they believed, here's their doctrine, they believed that Haile Selassie, Rastafari Makanian, was a descendant of King Solomon through the Queen of Sheba. That's, that's what they think. Now, whether or not he was a descendant of King Solomon through the Queen of Sheba, whether or not he was, the Word of God does not enthrone him to that point where anybody should worship him. After all, you're not even allowed to worship King Solomon. Why would you worship Rastafari Makonin, Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, who's dead now? See, so get that understanding, and it will help you know whether to keep the dreadlocks or not. And um, so that's it, really. Now, he says, why does the Bible allow slavery if all people are equals? So he says, why does the Bible allow slavery? Now, obviously, your question is not even well thought out because you're saying, why does the Bible allow? The Bible does not allow. The Bible is a book. See, so the Bible does not allow, but the Bible tells us about the life of human beings. It tells us how men enslaved other men. That's what the Bible tells us. So God's word doesn't allow slavery. It just tells us what other people did. He helps us understand how humans have lived through the years. And, you know, the thoughts of man, how he relates with others. And then he tells us what God really thinks about it. So I'm going to read you a portion of the Bible to help you understand what God really thinks about slavery. God detests it. He never allowed it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to read to you from verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, from verse 20. He says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. Now, the word servant in the King James translation is actually slave. Because it's the Greek word doulos. Doulos means slave. So... Um, if I would read it to you from maybe the, from the NIV, the New International Version, it says, each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. Did you hear that? Which means God prefers freedom to slavery. Now, he's talking to slaves. He says, if you, if you received Christ, when you were a slave. He says, don't care, don't worry, don't think it's a problem. There's a reason he tells you this, I'm gonna read it to you. He says, when you, when you receive Christ, your, your social position may not necessarily change, your job position may not change, 
If you were in the army, he says, you can still remain in the army. If you were a liar, you can still remain a liar. If you were a teacher, you can still remain a teacher. And it goes on about all of this. And then it goes on to also refer to if you were married. He says, you don't have to become unmarried because you're, you've received Christ. He says, remain where you are. Now, let me go on. He says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freed man. See how God thinks. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. In other words, he says, have the mentality of service to Christ. If you became a Christian as a free man, he says, hey, whether you were, whether you were a slave or you were a free man, he says, Christ is the same for both of you. If you have been enslaved, he says, don't care. It will not change the circumstances of your spirit because the victory of Christ is in your spirit and you can still live in dominion. In other words, the word of God will work for you irrespective of your condition, your social position. So think like that. So uh, I'm trying to tell you um, the word of God didn't permit slavery. God's thinking about it is that human beings enslaved others and God prefers freedom to slavery. He already said so. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preacher's pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. 
We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preacher's pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. was the mark God put on Cain when he was cursed I've heard that it was the color of his skin is this true <laughs> you know there are people who say a lot of stupid things um, and they lift from the Bible and and this is one of them they say that uh, it had to do with the color of his skin I'd like to read that portion to you first it's in Genesis in chapter number four you know the Lord had a problem with Cain. Cain killed his brother Abel. And um, God punished him for doing that. But then, when, when he complained, I'm going to read from verse 13, a fairly long one. And I want you to listen to this. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. What was the punishment, you say? That had nothing to do with the color of his skin. Let me read it to you from verse 12. God said to him, maybe I should read you the story just better. Okay. Um, beginning from verse 9, after Cain had killed his brother. From verse 9, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which had opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A figurative and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. That was his punishment. God said, you're going to be a wandering man. You're just going to be moving from place to place. You know, that means you have no peace. You have no rest. That's what God said to him restlessness will be your lot and um, and that's the same thing today you know those who kill others and those who terrorize the lives of others they're not at rest they're forever on the run going from place to place hiding from the life is terrible because it kills somebody so this was his punishment and Cain said in verse 13 and Cain said unto the Lord my punishment is greater than I can bear Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a figurative and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. Did you see that? Now, Cain is complaining. He says, Oh God, now you've driven me out, and everywhere I go, somebody's going to be looking out to kill me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Now God says nobody must kill Cain. Anybody who does it, vengeance will be taken against him seven times as much. Now here's where the problem is. Then here's where the, the question's coming from. The Bible says here, And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. The Lord set a mark on Cain. And uh, many Bible commentators have actually used the scripture to say that um, uh, Cain was made to look strange in his body so that anybody who saw him would say, oh, you know, and, and, and go away from him. 
you know? And some even went as far as to use this to justify uh, slavery of black people many years ago because they said the, the black people were descendants of Cain. Now let me make this clear to you. There's nobody in the earth today that's a descendant of Cain. Nobody in the earth that's a descendant of Cain. Nobody. Because the Bible tells us how that all the descendants from Adam that you have in the earth today came through Seth. You have to understand that. Not through Cain. Now that's another day's story. But this is something to understand. There's nobody in the earth today that's a descendant of Cain. But um, this has nothing, this mark anyway, has nothing to do with the punishment on Cain. In actual fact, it was a blessing here if you notice. The punishment was that he would be a figurative and a vagabond. Here, about the mark, it was something positive because God had to set a mark on him so that nobody would kill him. Now, well, what kind of mark was this? The Hebrew word here is ot, and um, it's a, a strange word here, and it actually refers to a miraculous sign. So it wasn't something on his, on his skin. It wasn't a card of some kind. It wasn't a, a, um, a physical sign of some kind. So God didn't put a physical sign on his body. What it says here, he set a mark upon Cain. He didn't say he set a mark on his body. It wasn't on his body. He set it on Cain. Now the reason, he says, and the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. That's what the Bible says. So nobody would kill him. Now, did God ever do anything like this in the Word? If you want to know exactly what God did here, you have to look at the Scripture and say, what else? How, how did God do things like this? Did He ever do anything like this to anybody else? So you can know what, what that mark could have been. Emphatically, yes. In the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, the Bible tells us something, and um, I want you to go there and look at it. I'm going to read to you from verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. Now, here was Jesus talking to Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And the Bible says that the Lord spake to him in the night by a vision and said to him, Be not afraid, speak and hold not your peace. And then he says, I am with you, and no man shall touch you to hurt you. I am with you. Now, how was he going to accomplish this? The people weren't going to see Jesus with Paul to stay clear of him. No. There was a supernatural presence of God. There was uh, an unseen presence to guide and protect him. So that all that period, nobody would touch him. It was something supernatural. That's exactly what God was talking about when he says, And the Lord set a mark on Cain. It's a supernatural mark. And that's what that word also refers to. A supernatural sign. Which means a miraculous sign. There was a divine presence about Cain. Such that no one would touch him. No one would kill him. And this is the same thing that he did for Paul. When he said, now, I've got many people in this city. And don't be afraid. As long as you're doing this job here, nobody's going to touch you. Meaning, if anybody even dreamt of it, if anybody wanted to do something about it, they'll fail because God had a mark on Paul. Now, you can understand it's the same thing about us. He's got a mark on us. We are protected divinely by the hand of God. Hallelujah. So that's not a, he wasn't talking about the skin, a mark on his skin. He was talking about something spiritual.
I would like to know the difference between faith and God's time. How can we reconcile the two with respect to receiving answers to our prayers? Is there anything like God's time to one who has faith? Yes, it depends on what the subject is. Most of the time, there are two classes of things that we, um, we want to relate with God for as far as our expectations and prayers are. You classify these as indefinite subjects and definite subjects. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Indefinite subjects here would refer to those things that the Word of God hadn't specifically said something about. For example, your job. He spoke generally about your job, but not specifically about your job as to what company you're going to work in, uh, what type of business you're going to do. Um, he didn't say something specifically about the school you go to and then uh, your relationships, you know, as to who do you keep friends with, um, who do you relate with today or tomorrow, and so on and so forth. So there are indefinite things that we might want to pray about. Maybe you want to embark on a journey and you're praying, do I go to that city or not? These things are not definitely spoken of in the Word, but He's given us general guidance. So God's timing becomes relevant in these issues because um, he, he leads you by His Spirit. And you can know of God's timing through your relationship with the Holy Spirit. So if you know the Holy Spirit in your life and you understand the guidance of God's Word, because we're guided by the Word, because the Word of God is light, and we're guided by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. So if you listen to the Holy Spirit, He can guide you about the timings of God. And that's important. So learn to walk by the Spirit. Learn to work in step with God through the Holy Spirit. And that means that your fellowship with the Holy Spirit has to be better. And then he will guide you in the affairs of life. Now the second category are those things that are definitely spoken of in the word. Now, because these things are so definite in the word of God, there's no such thing as timing, but the time is now. For example, when he talks about your salvation, it's very definite. When God talks about your righteousness, it's very definite. You don't have to pray, oh God, am I, do I have to be, am I, when am I going to be righteous? It's now. It's in Christ now. Your justification is now. You know, who are you in Christ? All of these things. Are you a victor in any situation? Yes, your victory is now. All of these things. So, there are those things that God's Word has spoken definitely about, and you don't have to pray about them as to, when is this going to happen? Usually all of those things come into now because they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. But as to working out the indefinite things of life, you would need to be guided by the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to know the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to learn to walk with Him. Christianity is a supernatural walk with God. perm their hair because my mom refuses for me to do so. Well, if your mom doesn't want you to perm your hair, don't perm it. But it's got nothing to do with going to heaven. Your hair, what about those who don't have hair at all? The people who have shaved off all their hair, are they going to go to hell because they shaved off all their hair? Your hair will not take you to heaven or not allow you to go to heaven. It's got nothing to do with going to heaven. Now, you see, this is, this is the religiosity that we have in the world. You know, a lot of people, they've got so much human religion, and they try to use their human religion to teach the Word of God. And so they, they try to tell us what sin is and what sin is not. And, you know, things are changing so fast. For example, several years ago, um, dancing, to dance, they said it was a sin. And then, um, you know, it was placed together. In fact, I remember a song. That used to say, they used to say in the song, stop your dancing and smoking and wearing miniskets. You see that? Dancing, smoking and wearing miniskets were called sins. 
Imagine they're put together at the same level. That's amazing. And then there was a time uh, the watching of TV was said to be a sin. The television was called a devil's box because they said that sinful things were shown on television. And so it was wrong to have a, a television set in your house. This was, this was back then, religion, and it still goes on today. Same thing with those who say that uh, uh, a Christian lady should not wear trousers because um, it's man's fashion. You know, all of these things are based on ignorance. That's why I said you need to have an understanding of the concept of sin. What is sin? Don't ask, Pastor, is this sin? Is this sin? Don't ask that kind of a question. Understand what sin is. Once you know what the Bible calls sin, then you will know what is sin and what is not sin. Otherwise, you're going to be asking, is it sin to eat meat on Good Friday? Is it sin to eat? Is it sin to do this? Is it sin to touch? All of these things are carnal. And God wants you to become spiritually minded and get out of asking questions of what is sin to practice in righteousness. See, your spiritual growth should go beyond um, living, uh, uh, dealing with dead works. Go into perfection. Leave the good for the best. Stop struggling about what is, what is bad and what is good. Is this sin? Go beyond that. Okay, if we say it's not sin, are you going to start doing it? That's got nothing to do with it. What you're supposed to do is live your life in righteousness. There are greater things in God. There are more beautiful things in Christ. Beyond trying to find out whether something is sin, just so you may not do it because it's sin. Or you may, no, 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 go beyond that in your life. Practice greater things. There are greater things in God. I, I can read that to you so you understand what God thinks about these things. You know, you know well, if, you, if, you, if you are, if you are um, in a circle of Christians, believers, who are, not, who are immature, they keep talking about what is sin, what is not sin, instead of understanding what the Word teaches, now, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. I'm reading to you from verse 1. It says, therefore, leaving, that means going beyond, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. It says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. This we will do, God permit. You understand? Well, we can deal with that when we're dealing with babes in Christ. But we've got to leave these fun fundamental principles and go on unto perfection. Grow in your life and stop sending messages around the internet. Pastor Chris said masturbation is not a sin. Wow, wow, wow. Something's wrong. You're not growing if you stay at that level and start passing that message around. You're kidding yourself. Get out of that rot. Lundev. Lundev is from South Africa. And he says, Dear Pastor Chris, I'm trying to be a good Christian, but I'm a lawyer, and I'm always tempted to sin. I'm really confused. What shall I do? Shall I quit my profession? Is there a way to reconcile the turmoil in my mind? A very honest question. But you know, the problem is not your profession. If, um, if the profession were not in service to humanity, maybe it would be a problem. But it's not a problem. The profession itself is good. The problem is maybe something's wrong with how it's practiced by some, including you. Now, what the Bible says is for us to let our light shine. He said, we are the light of the world. And if you recognize what God has said about you, what Jesus has said about you, 
that you are the light of the world and be that light in your world, then you'd find you're able to reconcile what you call this turmoil in your mind. It will solve the problem when you know who you are. So you are a light in a dark place. And so you function that way. Then there's a, a scripture I'd like to read to you. In Proverbs chapter 1, in verse 10, he says, My son, if sin has enticed thee, consent thou not. If sin has enticed you, he says, don't consent. Do not agree with them to do what's wrong. It's simple. You can. You can, you can refuse to do what's wrong. Because you are the light. So let your light shine. That's what Jesus said. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. So that's how simple it is. Being what God has called you. And um, it's important for me to quickly point out that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, you will have to receive the Holy Spirit. You need to do that. But uh, how can you do that? Several ways. First, as an act of your own faith in God's word. Because Jesus said, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Which means you can ask and receive. Ask the Father and receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Alternatively, go to the church and talk to, the, to any of the leaders in the church. Let them know you want to receive the Holy Spirit and they'll tell you exactly what to do. And someone will minister to you, pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. You relate the Bible to your life by first understanding it. See, the Bible says, with all I get and get understanding. You've got to have understanding. If you don't have the understanding, um, you can't apply it. You've got to understand what the Word of God says. Now, if you can understand it, then the power to influence your life is in the Word itself. When you study it, it's got the power to influence your life. It's got the power to talk to you. You see, because it's the Word of God. It's anointed. The Word of God is anointed. So it will produce results in you. It will talk to you. But you must open your understanding to it. And that can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you have not received the Holy Spirit, it will be difficult for you to understand the Bible. So, because the Holy Spirit is our inner teacher. He lives in us and He teaches us the Word of God. So, make sure you receive the Holy Spirit. Get to your pastor and tell him you want to receive the Holy Spirit. Alright? And um, He should minister to you. And I said, if you can understand it, the word is anointed to produce results in you. Definitely, it will produce results in work in you. That's what the Bible teaches. So you don't have to wonder, how am I going to relate it? You don't have to plan to relate it. It will be related to you through the Spirit. Listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. 
You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.